All right. Well, thanks, Julianne. I really appreciate that introduction. And I'm sorry that uh, John Richardson, Richardson couldn't be here today. Yes, um, he's unwell. That's a, that's a shame. But I really appreciate the uh, opportunity that you give uh, visiting Heads of Post to come out and brief um, members of the state governments, the business communities, universities, and so on. So I have been on a six city tour, if you like, uh, and this is my last stop. <laughs> so I've been on the road for a couple of weeks, um, engaging with uh, a whole range of uh, different government departments in the states, a whole range of businesses and also uh, peak bodies, uh, and of course educational and uh, cultural organisations uh, that uh, have some sort of involvement with the South China region. And what I'm trying to do is part of my uh, visit this time is really to highlight why I think, or why DFAT thinks uh, and the government thinks that South China matters much more than ever before to Australia. Uh, and we have a vision for engaging the South China region and I want to uh, outline that to you today and explain a few of the things that we've been doing, especially over the past uh, year or so to adapt our priorities in line with the changing uh, needs and opportunities in the region. Now, I don't need to convince any of you about the importance of China, and I'm not going to try and do that. I know that you're already all very strongly engaged with China. But I just want to talk a little bit about South China. Um, Julianne mentioned we look after several provinces in South China from the consulate in Guangzhou. The main one, of course, is Guangdong province. Guangdong being the largest province in uh, economic terms in China. But we also uh, look after a bevy of uh, provinces around the edges of Guangdong. So that includes Fujian uh, and Hunan. In Hunan being the only inland province that, that we are responsible for. We also look after Hainan Island, uh, which some of my colleagues think is very unfair. Uh, and we've got uh, uh, Guangxi and uh, Yunnan to the west. So my observation has been over a long period of time, I won't say how long, of working and living in China uh, over the years is that the South China region has been relatively, I think, misunderstood and for the most part overlooked uh, by a lot of stakeholders in Australia, uh, including myself, um, for many years. And most of us probably know Guangzhou, for example, uh, through the annual pilgrimages to the Canton Fair. Has anybody ever been to the Canton Fair? Yes, a few. <laughs> but for the most part, there's been a general rush to engage China through the, uh, the windows of the bigger cities of Beijing and Shanghai and the eastern seaport. But my view is that I, uh, Guangzhou and, and South China in general, while it was probably uh, aptly described as a bit of an ugly duckling in the past, is really blossoming into a pretty good looking swan these days. Um, and all you have to do is look at the way the Australian government is increasing its resources in, in the South China region. We are expanding. It's one of the few places in the world where we are increasing our resources. Uh, in line with the opportunities and the challenges there. And now uh, Guangzhou, uh, Australia, the Australian consulate in Guangzhou is now the second largest mission out of about 45 consular missions in that, in that area. Now I don't want to give you too many statistics because that gets a bit boring, but I do want to uh, put some of this in context and give you a sense of the scale for those of you who aren't as familiar with the southern China region. If you take those six provinces that I was talking about, they account for a quarter of the whole population of China. And they also uh, make up about 17% of our bilateral trade. Now, Guangdong province itself has the highest GDP of any province, uh, of any, well, of any provincial economy. It's a bit over 900 billion US dollars, um, which I think, based on uh, recent statistics, might be a near equivalent of a country like Indonesia. So the scale is enormous. 
Other provinces are getting pretty close and they're breathing down Guangdong's neck, uh, if you like. But the province still produces about a quarter of China's exports. Unenviably, it has the widest gap between the rich and poor of any province. So it's not all good. There's also pockets of poverty there. Um, talking about wealth, uh, if you look at the state-owned enterprise sector in Guangdong, the assets of that sector alone in that province are worth something like one trillion Australian dollars. <coughs> so I just want to also uh, not just dwell on the economic, but, brief, but briefly mention the fact that there are very substantial people, people ties that we have with that region. Of course, uh, South, South China uh, migrants have been coming here for more than 150 years. Um, these days we tend to process something like 100,000 visas a year uh, for people from South China who wish to visit Australia. At the same time, there are about the same number of visits from Australians uh, into, uh, into Guangdong each year. Um, so we're on a pretty even, even keel there. The number of Australians that are living uh, in our consular district has increased by about 40% since the last election. So uh, it's, there's substantial growth uh, in interest by Australians in coming to that part of the world to, to live, to work, to study. There are more students also from Guangdong, more Chinese students from Guangdong than from any other province in China coming into Australia to study. So they are a major source of uh, uh, they are a major source of uh, student base for our educational institutions. At the moment, we believe there's about, uh, well, there's more than 800 Australian business entities registered in Guangdong province, but we think the real number of Australian business people working there is much higher than that. Uh, there are, of course, many businesses being run by Australians. So that gives you a bit of a flavour, and just moving on to talking a bit about the economy, because I know that's always in the papers, and it's always in front of mind for us. Just looking out from the window of South China, uh, what's really happening in the trade and investment relationship with Australia? Well, I think that this is uh, a complex time for South China's economic managers. Of course, we've still got ongoing weakness in the global economy, and that's contributed in that region to struggling exports, uh, slowdown of GDP, uh, asset bubbles, and of course social tensions that we see from the, the rising wealth gap. Uh, but the effects of the most recent economic downturn, I think, have been much more nuanced and much more varied in South China. And that compares to just a few years earlier during the global financial crisis when there was a general downturn across industries in China. But now what we see is that certain areas of the country uh, are growing while others are perhaps uh, st standing still or, or uh, still in downturn. There's also a marked difference that we see between different sectors and industries. So there's a lot of grey in there now. It's not really as black and white as it used to be. Now, for example, just to give you a bit of a, uh, uh, a flavour of um, one of our provinces, the uh, southeastern coastal province of Fujian, I don't know whether or not you've visited Fujian before, but it's traditionally been seen as a bit of a backwater uh, and a bit of a favourite spot for the smuggling trade. Mm -hmm. um, but I was really interested to read recently that the high-tech industry output in Fujian uh, last year uh, exceeded 1 trillion RMB, and that was an expansion of something like 15%, and, and it made up for about 20% of the Fujian economy. So that was pretty interesting. Um, and in Guangdong province, there's a definite refocus of policy, of economic policy that we're seeing towards this much talked about economic <coughs> uh, rebalancing. That's also happening as a natural reaction to the weakness in export markets that's happening across China. Um, but the South Chinese are, are pretty well known for being innovative and adaptable. Um, and that's partly because provinces like Guangdong and Fujian rely a lot more heavily on the private uh, sector, on the private economy, uh, than other parts of China. And 
I think in the next few years uh, there are predictions that the private sector will make up something like 45% of Guangdong's economy. So it's quite substantial um, and a big change. Um, there are, of course, a handful of uh, major companies, uh, global Fortune 500 companies in South China. Uh, and it's also a hub for SMEs, uh, including many Australian SMEs. Because of this uh, structure of the economy, during the GFC there was a lot of blood on the factory floor, so to speak, and including in the private sector. They really did have a very bad year uh, in 2012, uh, and uh, there have been uh, significant problems um, uh, in the economic sector. The, the companies that are surviving, or that did survive these, uh, these lean times, we think um, seem to have emerged towards recovery much faster than perhaps other regions. Um, and they've re-emerged with more efficient operating models because, as I said, uh, they are, they tend to be very innovative and adaptable in South China. So while the business sector in, in South China really, really took, took it on the chin, I think they've been able to get up again faster. Uh, and to give you an example, uh, I want to talk about Dongguan. Has anyone heard of Dongguan or been there? Okay, I thought some of you might have been there because of course uh, the then Premier uh, of Victoria was in Dongguan last year uh, and uh, on, on his super trade mission. So many of you might have been involved with that. Um, but Dongguan, for those of you who don't know, is a, a bit of a patchwork of factory towns. Um, uh, it's about halfway between Guangzhou and Hong Kong. Um, and it's been called the world's factory floor for the better part of 30 years. Uh, and it, for a, a long time it's been one of Guangdong's most prosperous cities. Uh, and if you looked back for, to about 10 years ago, you'd see that the GDP there uh, was approaching 20% on average each year. So um, super fast growth. And for a long time, most economists looked at Dongguan as a bit of a bellwether for what was going on in the export sector in China. But I don't believe it's as black and white as that anymore. Um, and the reason is uh, because last year, when the global economy was back in the doldrums, um, Dongguan's economic growth slowed to just 2.5%. It was the worst performing city in Guangdong province. Uh, which is quite telling. So if you uh, take Dongwan as your standard for uh, as a mine canary, you would have said, looking at those figures, that China was in for a pretty hard landing. And a lot of economists, including uh, Australian economists who travelled to the region to have a bit of a look around and saw this going on, drew this exact conclusion. But interestingly enough, if we uh, fast forward to 2013 and we look at the, look at the results for Dongguan City in uh, the first quarter of this year, there's been a pretty robust and fast recovery in manufacturing with GDP uh, up again to 8.6%. So more than 7% more than it was in the same period last year. So, more importantly, what we see is that the growth in investment in that city was up 32% in that period. So there's quite a bit of momentum in the recovery there. This is quite a confusing picture and it's hard to see what you make of it. But what, it, what I think it might show is that the Pearl River Delta region is in transition and it's already on its way to becoming a more diverse and dynamic economy. In that province, there's a very conscious policy to transition the economy from what has been a largely labour-intensive model into a more capital-intensive, higher-value-added economy. Um, this process is going on now. We can see they're in the, in, in the middle of it. It's going to take time, and we're going to see ups and downs while it's happening. So I think uh, it's a pretty interesting situation. It doesn't mean that export processing <coughs> is going to completely vanish. Uh, from that region. 
But I think it, what it does mean is that we can't take the export sector or the export processing sector as the main bellwether anymore uh, for what has become an increasingly complex regional economy. And it's reflected in the feedback that we get from all the provinces that we work with and of course that you work with in, in, in your roles as well um, about the sort of cooperation they're looking for from Australia. Because almost every provincial government that we speak to say to us they have a desperate need to grow their tertiary sector and to develop newly emerging areas of the economy in which Australia's got a lot of strengths. So for example, in, uh, in Fujian province, uh, we know they want to work with Australia to harness our food safety technologies. They're doing a lot of work in this area in Fujian because they have a big agricultural industry which they're trying to modernise. In Hainan, um, they've shown interest in our organic farming um, and also in our ocean industries for obvious reasons. In Hunan province, it's our environmental uh, services agenda that's really in demand. And in Guangdong, uh, it's fair to say that Australia's very strong R&D and technological expertise is of great interest to that province as it continues to uh, develop its advanced manufacturing. Um, and as the largest source of Chinese students to Australia, of course, Guangdong is seeking closer cooperation with Australian education institutions, uh, including it hopes uh, to get a campus in Guangdong at some stage. And in the tourism sector, what we see is that direct aviation links between Australia and Guangdong have grown four times in just three years. So we've now, we've now got something like 38 direct flights a week to Guangzhou uh, from various cities around Australia. Um, again, demonstrating the strength of our two-way tourism cooperation grow, growing and so on and so on it goes. So I think um, South China offers all of us a, a, a wide variety of diverse opportunities. Uh, and it has a wide uh, variety of diverse economies. Um, but it can't be all things to all people. And we live in a world of limited resources. Um, so it's really just a question, I think, of knowing that there are opportunities out there, but then looking for what you want to focus on and then focusing on your target. I'm going to talk very, very briefly uh, about something that a lot of people, when they talk about China, mention, which is, of course, urbanisation and demographic change. Uh, and of course, that's uh, one of the big tailwinds that's driving China's economy. Um, and it's driving our engagement there. So we've got factors like the declining agricultural labour force, we've got an ageing population, got a one-child policy and so on um, and these trends are going to continue to derive in my view uh, demand for our traditional trade in uh, in raw materials but we all know that that's <laughs> gone off the boil a little bit and so these trend, the urbanization trend fortunately is also going to drive uh, increasing demand for things like clean technology for South China cities um, for high quality agricultural products that address the people's real concerns about food safety because there are food scares almost every week and for things like energy saving d design um, for more comfortable living which is now demanded by the middle class <coughs> as well as advanced health and medical services and aged care services uh, and not to mention, of course, professional services of all kind, uh, of all kinds like uh, accountancy and, and finance and, uh, and logistics, things that people demand more and more as they move into an urbanised lifestyle. <coughs> I think, um, as a Victorian, I've happily observed that I think a lot of these sectors are obvious strengths of the Victorian economy. And the federal government's been very active in supporting state government relationships with China across the southern provinces. More broadly, uh, over the past year, we've initiate, initiated a, num a number of new projects that I believe will benefit Victorian businesses. Um, and I want to spend a little bit of time now outlining those to you. 
of course, you, you've probably, you're probably all aware that back in April, uh, the Trade Minister launched a, a new business, to business initiative. Um, the first one ever, actually, with a Chinese province, so it's quite significant. It's called the Australia Guangdong Business Cooperation Council. So it is a special business council that we've set up with Guangdong province, involving a handful of companies, about 10 companies on each side, that will provide a platform for businesses from both countries, uh, not just to build networks and, and talk about common issues, but we also hope, given uh, Guangdong's reputation for reform and innovation, we hope that it's going to come up with a few runs on the board in some sectors of interest to Australia. We want to get some practical outcomes out of the Council. Um, we also want to harness a critical mass of Australian businesses that are engaged in the services sector that we see as particular opportunities there um, and other emergency, emerging areas of opportunity. And I want, to, uh, I want all of you to know about this uh, development because Perhaps you might, in the future, have an interest in participating in the council. Um, the membership of this council will rotate through time and will be taking expressions of interest annually from, from uh, businesses and from industry bodies that, that would like to participate. So please spread the word around too, to uh, other, other business people that you know um, and other bodies that you think might be relevant or benefit from this. I'm also keen uh, to get ideas from the business sector and from government for things that we could put on the table for the council, things that have to be feasible, things that have to be achievable in a place like Wondong. Uh, following that development in April, um, we of course uh, know that the, uh, the Prime Minister visited Hainan Island for the BOAL Forum and, uh, around, at around the same time uh, and made a number of important announcements and I'm, I'm sure you all, you all know already about the lifting of our uh, relationship to a strategic partnership, the, um, the announcement about annual dialogues between leaders and senior ministers and so on. But at that time, you also will be aware that the government announced a direct trading between the Australian dollar and the renminbi, which we hope will make it easier for Australian companies um, like some of you here, uh, or those who represent the business sector here, to buy and sell into the Chinese market and to promote two-way investment. Um, on this note, I'd be really interested to get your feedback. Uh, for those, as, as those who are directly involved in doing business on how you think this is playing out here in Australia and in your business relationships. As you know, Guangdong is uh, one of the biggest sources of China's investment into Australia. Investment, again, is another topic that's always in the news. But I think that we've taken for granted for a very long time the potential and the level of investment interest that is coming out of South China. Um, recently, uh, we were very fortunate to have a visit, uh, a roadshow in China by the FERP. Um, and the reason why I say we've taken South China for granted is because th this is the very first time that the FERP has ever conducted a roadshow in that part of China, which is an interesting fact in itself. And it shows, I think, that we are now much more engaged in, in harnessing this potential uh, from that part of China. Australia is still uh, the number one destination for South China's outbound investment. Uh, I talk to investors just about, <laughs> just about every day, um, and I really am convinced that, I, that investors uh, that we see do see Australia as a very good proposition. They see us as a reliable <coughs> supplier. They see us as a, as a, uh, a stable democracy, a well-regulated uh, business environment, uh, <coughs> good banking systems um, and legal systems in place. They see us as a holistic package because we are also a, a very livable environment. We're a great place for migration. We're a great place to send your kids to study. 
that adds up to a really good package. The visit by the firm was a really good chance to drive that home again, uh, but also to hear the perspectives of um, the business sector in, in uh, all of our provinces across, across South China about what they don't what they don't like about uh, Australia and, and what what are the uh, the issues around investing in Australia. For example, the fact that we are a high cost economy. But of course, the answer to that is uh, that yes, uh, we make no apologies for that. Uh, we are a high cost economy, but we also have very significant advantages, which I think is recognised. It was a good chance to dispel a few myths, um, particularly about how open we are towards foreign investment. Uh, now that was a, uh, a pretty uh, interesting discussion. Um, China's usually regarded, if you read the newspapers in Australia, you probably think China's a really big player in our investment landscape. But looking at the figures, you'll see that its involvement is actually far lower than the general perception. Uh, investment from China has risen something like eight times, I think, over the past decade. Sounds pretty impressive. But still, China only ranks as the ninth largest investor in Australia overall. It accounts for something like 1% of our total investments, foreign investment stock and 3% of our FDI stock. So those are not terribly, terribly uh, large figures. And I'll say it again until I'm blue in the face, and I, and I know that you've probably heard this many times, but we've never knocked back an investment proposal from China, uh, a firm investment proposal <coughs> from China. We've put conditions on a few, but we've never knocked one back. And when we say this to uh, our business constituency in South China, they uh, sometimes open mouth because they, they, they were not aware of that. And we say consistently to the Chinese community uh, in, in, in Guangdong and around the provinces, we want you to invest far more aggressively than you are currently doing. Uh, please lift your game. You know, we've got a whole range of nationally mandated priority sectors and state government priority sectors where we need um, capital investment. So, from from the uh, national uh, perspective, of course, these are things like tourism infrastructure, innovation and clean energy, and major, other major infrastructure, the digital economy, innovation sectors, um, and of course, agricultural science and food processing and food technology. That's all I'm going to say about investment, but I'm also interested in what you think about that. Lastly, uh, I don't have time. Okay, all right, I'll try not to be too long. Lastly, uh, I just want to talk to you about another interesting thing that we've been doing, um, where you might be able to help us with some outreach. As we've been talking about Australia's growing business and consumer needs, growing very well, overwhelmingly positive. However, in recent years, what we've seen is that increased trade has resulted in a higher number of, number of commercial disputes. So these disputes are not always just about uh, fights between commercial giants. Often they can have a devastating effect on small companies that are doing business with China, even with ordinary Australians buying things over the internet, something as simple as that. Small companies are relatively more exposed because they don't have deep pockets and they don't have the legal and other resources enjoyed by the bigger firms. So you might ask, why am I talking about this sort of thing? Why am I talking about commercial disputes, the negative side of trade and investment, and the same breath as talking up trade and investment in South China. Well, the, the simple reason is that the Australian government's very concerned about this because we are frequently called upon to intervene in commercial disputes with China. But very often it is the case that we are unable to assist in any way in these sorts of private commercial matters. So, of course, we're very concerned about this, this trend. A couple of months ago, the government launched a new commercial disputes uh, initiative. It's called Doing Business in China. 
I think that uh, we've already had a presentation down here in Melbourne. No, that that was right? yeah, only to the ACBC. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to the ACBC. There's a lot of information on our website about that. Yes. Uh, this uh, it's an initiative that we're doing in partnership with uh, peak industry bodies um, and with business organisations, of course ACBC being a major partner. Um, and the whole point of it is to help to inform Australian businesses about the opportunities, but also about the potential risks of engaging in business in China um, and how, to, how best to manage these risks. It's something we haven't talked about a lot in the past, but now I think uh, we really need to do so. Some of the risks that Australian businesses uh, face uh, in overseas business activity include things like fraud, uh, contract breaches, uh, you know, intellectual property theft, um, and coming right down to intimidation, threats, restrictions on your movement, and even in extreme cases, criminal charges. So disputes are particularly likely to involve SMEs, and, and that's the reason uh, the reason for that is because the smaller companies lack experience in importing generally. Um, they're more likely to enter into informal or verbal business arrangements, which is a complete no-no. Um, they're less likely to inquire about the seller or the, or the other partner that they're dealing with, and they're less likely to seek professional legal advice. So uh, what we generally advise is if you can't afford to get legal advice, you should reconsider whether or not China is a good environment for you to be doing business. So the first stage of this initiative is going to uh, involve outreach um, to Australian companies through business events and seminars and so on, both in Australia and also uh, through our network of diplomatic posts in China. Um, and uh, so that's partly uh, what I'd like to do today is to make you aware of that. But the second stage um, of the initiative will involve um, uh, some promotion around um, arbitration um, options and arbitration clauses in commercial contracts. Also to build awareness about the ways to prevent disputes from escalating. So uh, as Julianne said, the Austrade uh, website, and I think the DFAT website also um, links to it, has a lot of material about this uh, and we encourage you if you're interested to go and have a look at it. So uh, essentially what we're all about um, with our commercial focus down in, in Guangdong is uh, ensuring really that Australian businesses and other players have the best possible chance of succeeding in what is a, an exciting but I think an increasingly complex market. So I'm going to stop there because I've talked for way too long. Um, so I look forward to your views and if anyone would like to take my business card, I'm keen to stay in touch um, and I'm happy to hear from you at any time. And thanks again for me. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you very much.